in high fidelity. Good evening. This is Andrew Loha live out of Flagstaff, Arizona, with Spiritual Miss Productions on Blog Talk Radio and Pre Conference Call and YouTube, establishing and maintaining right relationships between human body. Aloha, welcome to tonight's show. Tonight we're um, we're talking about um, we're t- tonight we're doing the Andrew Loha live show, talking with Andrew uh, the uh, now Bisaggio. How, how do you say your last name, Andrew? It's pronounced Bashago, like oh, Chicago. Bashago, oh, no wonder. Man, talk about throwing me for a loop. What the heck? So anyhow, uh, tonight we're talking about teleportation, life on Mars, and confessed time traveler. Um, and, and just to let, let you guys know, um, hang on a second time up. Andrew, uh, or American lawyer, writer, uh, chrononaut, chrononaut uh, 21st century visionary, team leader of Project Pegasus, and founder President of Mars, M A R S, um, Andrew D. Uh, B- Bishago, uh claims to be one of 140 kids who, in the late 60s and early 70s, participated in a uh, Dar- DARPA time space program called Project Pegasus, which succeeded in using pre- previously undisclosed N- Nikola Tesla papers to harness something called radiant energy, a uh, universal force which bends space time and allows us and allows for real time teleportation travel as well as time travel for more than one uh, ten years uh, Andrew has um, shared with American people the true facts of our great nation's accomplishments in tra- time travel and Mars visitation he his writings place him at the forefront of contemporary Mars research his paper the discovery of life on Mars published in 2008 was the first work to prove that Mars is an inhabited planet. After publishing his landmark paper, Bisaggio, or Chicago, Bisaggio, Bisaggio, help me out again. With, uh, that's, uh, is, is that Italian? Are you Italian? Or what, what's, where is that from? Actually, I'm, I'm part Italian on my mother's side. Our, my ancestry goes back all the way to sort of Florence. Uh, I've got a Morelli and an Orsini line up there. Oh, uh, interesting. From my... My, my my grandmother, my mother's mother's mother was Florentine. Wow. But actually, my surname is, is is a Polish surname, and my dad was from a Polish immigrant family that was, you know, 100% Polish. So I'm, I'm half Polish, and I'm Italian, German, Danish, and <laughs> Spanish on my matrilineal line. But okay. my, uh, you know, my my mother's DNA is ultimately Italian. So I... Prashago. 
also being Italian. Got it. Bashago, so is that right? Surname is a Slavic surname. Yeah, it's it's it's, uh, it's Bashago, like Kasha, Kasha bread. You know, in in Russia and Poland and Czechoslovakia. Yeah, I'm not familiar Slavic. with that bread, but right. go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, so that's that's a uh, that's a common uh, that's a common uh, Polish stem. For oh. example, Basha is the nickname for for Barbara. Huh. Barbie would be in, in English. Got it. Basha is a, is a diminutive for Barbara. So, um, <laughs> get it right. All right, all right. I'm, I'm getting there. Identify with being, with being members of the International Club of Andrew. <laughs> Got it, right? So, that's, that's a good start. Yeah. Right. So, after publishing his landmark uh, paper, uh, Bashago, founded Mars Anomaly Research Society, which stands for uh, Mars Anomaly Research Society. Mars. Uh, Bishago was the first American child to teleport and took part in probes to past and future events, utilizing different forms of time travel than being researched and developed by DARPA. He served in the two secret U.S. defense projects in which time travel on Earth and voyages to Mars were first undertaken. As a result, Bishago was credited with ending the time travel and Mars cover-up by the U.S. government on behalf of the American people. In past decades, the concepts of time travel and time slips were relegated to pop culture references to Back to the Future and the Terminator, but according to Bishago, time travel not only exists, it is part of a real-life Philadelphia experiment that includes teleportation technology, trips to Mars, and remote sensing military experiments. This tightly guarded technology is supposedly capable of not only yielding a truly revolutionary, revolutionary 21st century teleportation or transportation, it has resulted in, in bases on Mars being established along the, with government jump rooms where chrononauts, often children because of their ability to withstand the, and the wear and tear of time travel, leap through Stargate-like tunnels using advanced holographic technology. And if you want more information on Andrew D. Bishago, you can go to www.andy2020.net and uh, get a hold of him there if you want. So in the meantime, we are going to come back to, to talk to Andrew here in a second. But uh, first of all, I want to give a big aloha to all of our underwriters that help make this show happen from week to week, month to month, year to year, beginning with the 90 Day Ascension Journey a, uh, at www.90dayascensionjourney.com. When you sign up for the 90 Day Ascension Journey, you will be facilitated with defining and redefining your soul through life purpose. You will be assisted with finding out what ascension means to you on this journey. You will provide, be provided with tools, techniques, and assistance to empower you to connect and reconnect with yourself, your emotions and feelings, and your mind, body, and spirit. Through a universal soul-centered process, you will be going through a lifelong transformation that will allow you to mo- move forward with your endeavors and never look back as you, if you dare. And just for those of you guys that are interested, I wrote the book version of this uh, last year around April, and um, it basically, uh, it just to help, help people with this journey. I've, I've done this journey with a number of people, and uh, the transformations that have taken place have been pretty, pretty uh, definite, pretty, pretty substantial. So, if you want to read the book, then uh, you, know, you can actually you can get it on Kindle right now. I have it for 99 cents. I was trying to give it away for free, but somehow they wouldn't let me. So I said, "Well, forget it. We'll just do it for 99 cents." So you can read it, and if you like it, and if you want to go further, then you, can, you can get a hold of me, and we'll we'll talk about doing the journey if you want. So anyhow, we also have another tie at www.spiritualimagesproductions.anobite.com. And Novite is a French word, A-N-O-B-I-T-E. And uh, with over 25,000 scientific research papers uh, published on colostrum, a 90-day guarantee and winner of the Healthy Living People Cho- People's Choice Award twice over, Anobite focuses on helping people with weight loss, anti-aging, heart, di- heart disease, diabetes, depression, high blood pressure, asthma, allergy, rheumatoid ar- arthritis, inflammation, gout, Lupus, fibromyalgia, Crohn's disease, cancer, ulcers, the polio virus, chronic infections, digestive disorders, Alzheimer's disease, autoimmune disease, thymus gland, mental clarity, maintenance of protection and protection of the immune system, synthesis and repair of the RNA and DNA, and much, much more. Again, if you want to check it out, now if you want, uh, if, if you want more, uh, if you want to go back over any of this information, you, you can go to spiritualimageproductions.com. SpiritualImageProductions.com on the left hand side. There's a link that says Andrew Aloha Live. You can click on that page. That's where I'm at now, and you can retrieve all this information for yourself if you want. 
And finally, we do have Maha Dikini Lore at www.mahadikini.com. Maha Dikini Lore's life has been a personal journey exploring sexuality and spirituality for over 20 years. She's the certified tantric counselor and tantric healer and a certified mind and sound teacher. Maha Dikini Lore is also a graduate of Margot Nong's uh, year-long sky dancing tantra facility training program, as well as a current member of the American Association of Sex Education Counselors and Therapists Club and a charter member of the Association of Sexual Energy Professionals. She regularly attends trainings and conferences to keep current with the latest research and information on sexual education. And uh, again, uh, you can go to spiritualnessproductions.com, click on Andrew Aloha Live, and it'll take you where I'm at now. So anyhow, we, we, um, we have Andrew Basaji. Now, you're uh, um, uh, um, Bishago. Uh, you're, uh, uh, you're in Washington, Washington State. Is that where you live at? Is that where you're at, Andrew? Yes, I live and practice law at the federal and state level in the state of Washington. Got it, got it. And so if you can just kind of give us an overview of who Andrew Bashago is, where you grew up, and, and you know how you got to where you're at right now. Well, I, I grew up in, in suburban northern New Jersey and southern California. Um, I was brought into the classified defense department uh, research realm as a six-year-old when I first teleported between the Curtis Wright facility in Wood Ridge, New Jersey, to the New Mexico State Capitol grounds in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So let me get this uh, right. You, usually, you said you you're, you were six years old when you teleported, first teleported. Is that what I heard you say? Yes, that was in winter of 1968. I was born in September of 1961. So my father was going to be teleporting on a trip to present a research perspective to Dr. Harold Agnew at the Los Alamos National Labs. And they were always having individuals teleporting from the East Coast into New Mexico teleport into the state capitol grounds in Santa Fe. But my father once explained, if they teleport into the grounds of the Los Alamos National Laboratories, where the Project Manhattan physicists like Agnew and Keller and so forth were based, somebody might see something. So they knew that the KGB had infiltrated Lano, as it's called, or Alamos National Laboratory. So, so we were always teleporting into Santa Fe. And in fact, during my, my research trips to New Mexico, I actually encountered native Santa Feans who, who had seen or heard from witnesses it's the events where children were seen suddenly appearing in the state capitol ground. And that wasn't some kind of metaphysical <laughs> phenomenon, paranormal <laughs> phenomenon. It was, it was federal science. It was classified research that was partly based in New Mexico where they were using the state capitol ground so they could avoid tipping off any spies up in Lano in Los Alamos about the existence of this technology. If you look at the sort of the, uh, the built environment of the state capitol complex. There's a hodgepodge of buildings there with many perspectives and sort of different angles. So the kids suddenly popping into view would look like you just run around the corner of the building. And so that sort of was my introduction to the quantum research that was then going on. And then officially, I was placed in Project Pegasus in fall of 1969, which was the beginning of my third grade year. And I was in Pegasus for, for three years, my third, fourth, and fifth grade years from 1969 to 72. But during that period, um, my father and I, at one point in the fall of 71, teleported forward in time so that we spent the summer of 1973, or at least a summer of 1973, in so, New Mexico, so um, so let's let, 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 okay, let's let's take because this is a lot of information, and um, mm -hmm. and, and whenever whenever I do this this stuff, I try to do it so that people that are are really ignorant uh, are, are really, of what you're talking about, and they're like kids. So um, first of all, let's take a step back. Uh, I, I want what is Pegasus Project Pegasus, and also. How uh, how did your father get involved with teleportation? I mean, how did all that transpire? Go ahead. Right. Okay. Let's we'll go farther back. My dad, well, well, Project Pegasus was a federal classified research and development 
project under DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, which is essentially the leading developer of technology for the Defense Department, including weaponry, uh, intelligence gathering technology, communications technology, surveillance technology, and so forth. And there was a decision made in the mid-1960s to create under DARPA, with DARPA as the umbrella agency, a, a federal time travel project that would derive technology from everything and anything that would yield a time-space capability, time-space exploration capability. So they were into the intelligence funnel. They were placing ancient technologies, foreign technologies from the Nazi German and Soviet Russian experimentation with time travel, extraterrestrial technology, uh, and obviously the work of leading contemporary inventors and physicists, like especially Nikola Tesla. Got it, got it. My father had expertise in that area because when he was at the Thomas A. Edison Research Laboratory in West Orange, New Jersey, where he worked from 1956 to 64, he was asked to essentially recapitulate Tesla's work on teleportation. Got it, got it. He did. And so he was essentially the leading engineer in the country in terms of knowing the theory and practice of teleportation, Got it. which they hope to to translate into a teleportation-based time travel capability, which they did in 1970 when I was serving on the project as a fourth grader. In fact, I was one of the first Americans, or really first humans in this modern epoch of human civilization on Earth to time travel as a result of their improvements on Tesla teleportation, where you weren't just teleporting in real time, by opening up a portal tunnel in time space, you were doing so with an adjustment in time that's arriving before or after the real time origin of your jump uh, via Tesla teleportation. So, so let, let me let me get this straight. Let me get this straight. You're saying that back in the '60s they created Project Pegasus to pursue, to work on, to expand upon, to discover and enhance time travel something that Nikola Tesla had already uh, tapped into prior to. Is that what I hear no, you no, saying? No, 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 I'm not saying that. Tesla had developed, and in, in his papers that he left upon his death in 1943, had developed a device that they realized they discovered was a, tele, a teleporter for real-time teleportation. <laughs> what they wanted to do is take that technology and see if they could adjust the device so that the teleportee arrived in what we would call the past or future upon arrival at their destination. And they did achieve that by 1970. And so, so did, that did, was one of the major technologies they were dealing with. Got, and so, so now let, let me get this straight. D did Nicole, uh, Nikola uh, Tesla, Tesla, did he uh, already have a contraption, some kind of mechanism to, to time travel? Had he already built this already? He had, he had developed a teleportation device. So, for example, if we jump through it at, uh, you know, 10.30 a.m. New Jersey time and arrived at our destination in Santa Fe, New Mexico, we would arrive in real time, in other words, at 8.30 a.m. in Santa Fe. But during the first several years when I was on the project, on that first jump in 1968 with my father, when I was a first grader, I was a six-year-old, and, uh, and, and in 1970, where I was a fourth grader, during that period, they found a way to adjust the device so that that teleporter that Tesla had, had invented and left in his paperwork upon his death in 1943 was further evolved into a time machine where you could adjust the arrival time of the teleporter. Which, which your dad did. Is that what I hear you saying? He was on the DARPA team that achieved that, yes, and I was one of the first individuals to teleport to, to time travel by a, a Tesla teleporter that had been modified into a teleportation based time travel device. So, so was the, the Nikola Tesla, was the Tesla t a time, time travel machine, teleportation machine, was that operating reasonably at the time? Is that what you hear? And you guys, and these guys improved it and they, and they up, upgraded it? Is that what I hear you saying? Yeah, they, are, they already had the technology from Tesla, and what they were working on when I was brought into the program officially in 1969 
it, and a couple of years before then, was was to, to, to be able to adjust the device so that there was an offset in time. You weren't just traveling through one of these mortal tunnels in time space in real time, but so that when you arrived at your destination in time space, it was what we call the past or the future. But because it was physical time travel through a tunnel in time space, they had to develop other kinds of time travel because if they knew that if they teleported you to a time before the development of teleportation, you'd be <laughs> stranded there. You'd be <laughs> right, yeah, time. exactly. I hear you. So they were, they were working on forms of time travel that were not dependent on a device being at your destination that you could jump home, home through. So, so they were also simultaneously developing another major area of technology known as chronovision. Chronovision is where you create a hologram that's so densely energetic that it lenses a, past or, a hologram of a past or future event into the laboratory so that you're standing on the stage of the device where that hologram is created and envelops you, you you experience immediately going to that time and place that's being basically lent into the laboratory. So I was also being sent to distant locations in the past, for example, that I could not have teleported to without being stranded in the past because there weren't these Tesla teleportation devices before that could time travel before 1970. So initially, we were just making very short hops. That, the, that were in real time. We going to, yeah, they were primarily in real time. But then as the program progressed, they knew as long as they kept the time envelope within the period after 1970 where the technology already existed, they could play around a little bit with offsetting that in time via teleportation. But the major efforts to do that were via these devices called Chronovisors, where when the hologram that sent you to a past event collapsed, you were spontaneously back in the laboratory in New Jersey in, in the present. So they were working on different forms of time travel. There were about eight, and I've described how they went everything from conventional psychic time travel, which we know as remote viewing, all the way to the other side of the spectrum that involved different forms of physical time travel. And that's basically my message to the world, is time travel is not a future possibility. It's something that the U.S. Defense Department under DARPA reduced to practice in 1970. Not just the 1970s, but the year 1970 is when American researchers secretly developed time travel. And that was the very secret and sensitive event for which a lot of the folklore about time travel has been scripted as disinformation. Now, so now let me ask you this. So, okay, so I want, I want to be clear about it. So in 1970... Uh, or somewhere there, they they created the, the 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 hologram device so that it time travels with you, and so now you can time travel to the past or the future. Is that what I hear you saying? No, the the, the chronovisors originated in work that was achieved by two Vatican scientists named Ernetti and Gemelli, who are working on studying the harmonic patterns in Gregorian chant at the Catholic University of Milan in the 1940s, found a way to capture the signal of a past event and amplify it and bring that sound or ultimately that light into the laboratory. Time travel per se was achieved in 1970 when they, they working with the Tesla teleporter, they found a way to adjust Tesla's device so that you arrive in a, at a time-space coordinate in the quantum hologram, what we would call the time-space continuum, before or after the time you had jumped through the device. So you arrived at a time that was either in the past or the future. So the whole... Was, Go ahead. Well, Chronovision emerged in the same year but with a different technology. The, the Tesla teleporter as a time travel device was not a holographic application like the chronovisor. Rather, it opened up a tunnel in time space through which the teleportee passed. In the case of chronovision, that device was literally generating holograms that we were visiting that were sort of recapitulations of past and future events. We were, we were going there on a paraphysical basis in a hologram, whereas the Tesla teleporter allowed for physical displacement in time. Okay, okay. So now... The hologram was like a neutral ground 
where you were teleported first and then to your next port of, of, of travel? Is that what I hear you saying? Or was that all taking place no. in the hologram? No. Well, look, look, look. The, the teleporter opens up, the Tesla teleporter opens up a vortex in time space. Space is very dense. One meter of space contains as many Earths of energy as there are grains of sand on every beach on Earth. Got it. On all the beaches of Earth. It, in other words, space is extremely <laughs> dense. We tend to think of it as a vacuum. But in fact, it's extremely energy dense. Okay. And so what the Tesla teleporter was doing was we were, we were jumping through a field of radiant energy, which Tesla had discovered is latent and pervasive in the entire physical universe. So that when our inertia struck that field of energy, basically a tunnel opened up in that very dense field of space. Just like when it was a simple blowing on a through a ring that's covered with soap creates that long soap bubble. Okay, our inertia of jumping through that field of radiant energy opened up a tubule in time space through which we pass. Okay? But a completely different application was created by making a very dense hologram that was so dense that it would lend the residual signal initially of a past event and then ultimately the potential signals of future events in the laboratory and amplify it so by standing in that hologram you could experience a past or future event as sort of a a technically but or nonetheless organic virtual hologram of what had happened or what would happen at that place in time. So, so we, there were two different technologies. Got got it. I hear you. And what I hear I hear you saying um, is well first of all to be clear it was Tesla, did he produce the first time travel machine or mechanism? Is that no, correct? He, he produced he produced the first functional teleporter where, in an opposite way from what was at that time being dramatized on Star Trek, which was quantum teleportation. That's where you disintegrate the teleport. You use some means to, to send their energy to, no, uh, to another their, location. Or their atom or their atomized atoms to another location and then reintegrate them. The problem with that technology is by disintegrating their cell, you would stop their cellular metabolism. You would kill the person or any other living creature that you would teleport. In that wow. Way. So Tesla, Tesla was working on had achieved a way to create that field of radiant energy. So when you opened up the tunnel, the teleportee remained intact physically and energetically and passed through a tunnel in time space. In other words, it manipulated the environment that the teleportee was passing through rather than the teleportee him or herself. Okay, so Tesla didn't develop time travel because upon his death in 1943, he had not yet found a way to adjust the device so that the teleportee would arrive in the past or future. He had, however, developed a device that allowed the teleportee to travel vast distances through the device by going through tunnels in time space with no inertia. In other words, there were no G-forces on us when we were jumping through that field of radiant energy and the tunnel was opening up. In fact, sometimes it didn't even feel like we were moving forward. It felt like the tunnel was whooshing past the side of our head, right? Huh. In other words, about 15 feet, but a tunnel about 20, 15, you know, 15 to 20 feet across. It sometimes felt like we were just standing there suspended in space as the tunnel was wishing past us and behind us, you see. So it was it was basically a null field in time space to which we were passing because Tess had found a way to tunnel through that dense densely energetic matrix of time space so that we would go literally through time, not not across time. We got would it, got it. through the time space hologram. And, and yet he hadn't found a way so that the teleportee arrived to the past or future when they reached their destination. Got but it. My father and his colleagues at, on, te, uh, on Project Pegasus, by 25 years or so after Tesla's death, I mean, 1968 was 25 years after 1943. So Tesla died in 43, and it took our defense department, our leading physicists and electrical engineers, about a quarter of a century to figure out. In 65 years. First, you know, you know, tw well, tw 25 years to, to figure out how to convert that Tesla teleporter into a time machine. And they did that when I was serving on the project. I was one of the first individuals. I mean, I had been the first American child 
to teleport when my dad took me on that 1968 trip to meet Dr. Agden on the Los Alamos labs. <laughs> but then as I went further and further down the rabbit hole of applied quantum physics, we started to notice when they would teleport us back to Curtis Wright from the Sandia National Labs outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico, that, you know, we would spend the whole day in New Mexico, even get a late dinner at the Howard Johnson's on Central Avenue in Albuquerque. But that when we were arriving back in New Jersey, it was like 10.30 or 11 o'clock of the day we had left. And we, we asked them, are you putting us back at time? <laughs> and they said, yeah, we are. And, and these are the sort of functions that the people are escort us. Okay, so you're cutting out, Andrew. Hang on a second. You're cutting out for some reason. I don't know what's going on. Okay. It's not a, I, just, I don't know if it's your phone or mine, but something's going on. Oh. oh. Yeah, you Can you call back yeah. in? Try call. Sure, I will, I will call. Right okay, now. let's do okay. that. If some, some, something's up. So we're going to have a Andrew Bushago call back in. There's some weird uh, technical stuff going on. And he's cutting out really bad, and so so the, the, it's so it's interesting to note that Tesla invented a a, a, a machine or a, a, a system where you can uh, travel in in time or in space or from one location to another in real time, and and then um, and that's as far as he got, and then and then um, Andrew Bushago's father and his team uh, invented a machine a, a system that. <clears throat> that would uh, allow uh, people to try, time, time travel in the future or, or into the past is what I'm understanding. So, um, I, and I need to ask that uh, to make sure that that's correct. So, um, um, I don't know what's going on. I don't know. Did we lose him? I don't see him. Let's try this. Um, yes, I don't know what's going on. There was some weird stuff going on. So um, I'm going to see if I can get him to call in to the, to the station and then see if we can get him there instead. So for whatever reason he's not, not coming back in. <clears throat> Any time now. Oops. Let's do that. I'm not sure what's going on. Anyhow, we have Andrew uh, D. Bashago. Uh, okay, here we go. He's back. So, are you, are you, Andrew D. Bashago. Yeah, yeah. Are you back? Yes. Would you quit playing around? What the heck? We're trying to do an interview. What's up with that? <laughs> I don't know what it was. Um, yeah, it was weird. But that's okay. We um we can continue. Um, <clears throat> so okay, so um, so Tesla invents a machine that you can tra travel from one location to another. And more like uh, one, trouble in time yeah, yeah. yeah you, like one frequency type of thing uh, in real time. And then your father and his team uh, elaborate and, and expand that that system. So now you can travel into the future and in the past, and and also real time. Is that what I hear you saying? Is that correct? Yeah, you can do both. I mean, some <clears throat> some of the teleporting we were doing was just teleporting in real time. Some of it was teleportation based time travel. But they were also developing other forms of physical time travel because of the threat of teleporting somebody to a time before the development of the teleporter. There wouldn't be any teleporters at the destination to get them home. So they had to do things like uh, propagate holograms that they would then collapse so we would spontaneously come back to the laboratory. Now, there's a kind of a mystique about that. Let me explain something. There's a big, there's a, there's a big error of logic that is commonplace now in time travel discussion, but I want to clarify. That's not a metaphysical limit. You know, people say things like you can't time travel to a time before the development of the technology. 
as if it's some universal constant. That's nonsense. The problem, in fact, is that you can teleport somebody to a time before the development of the teleporter, and unless you've constructed a teleporter from the future by taking it through a teleporter and establishing it that past location, the problem, in fact, is that you would strand that, that <coughs> teleportee in that past time before the development of the technology. In other words, it's not some metaphysical constraint based on a universal constant. It's the practical problem of stranding somebody exactly. in a time and a place where the technology has not been developed yet. It's not germane to you know, some magical influence of when the teleporter was developed. I hear, I hear you, and I, I, I hear yeah. you loud and clear, and I know exactly what you're talking about. So what I'm, uh, what uh, I hear you also saying is they developed a device to to uh, either take with you for the to the to the past um, or some kind of location like a GPS monitor where they locate you and then bring you back from the past. Is that what I hear you saying? Well, no, they weren't. There was no need to to, to try. Well, they, they were they were experimenting with different ways of identifying us in the past, you know, dimensionally. <clears throat> like one time when we were in a chronovisor probe to ancient Arizona, we were given these boxes about the size of a small laptop or one of those toolkits you keep in your car. You know, one of those plastic toolkits with uh, you know box box wrenches in it and stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. that had a radius on that, that, that opened up at a 45 degree angle towards the sky when you slid open the top of the box huh. because they were trying to establish connections between dimensions. So there was some of that going on in the project on the experimental basis. But no, we, we came back into the laboratory when they collapsed the holograms of the chronovisors generated simply because we had been temporarily embedded in that past time and place and later future times and places. Uh, but initially it was, it was holography that was embedding us in the past, so that when they basically collapsed the hologram, we were just back where we had started. They, weren't, they didn't need to identify where we were. But that was a way to send us to the ancient past. For example, in the, in the, in the first chronovisor probe that I was involved in, I was sent to a Civil War battle. And I actually was overtaken by the battle by the Confederate forces, and I was hiding beneath the berm as, as Confederate troops were jumping over the berm, yelling, rebel yell, you know, with their bayonet stick. But the second probe I took with a group of children under the direction of Jack Pruitt, who later went on to become the research director for Project Montauk. He was one of the principal team leaders on Project Pegasus 15 huh. years earlier, 15 wow. years before Montauk on Pegasus. Okay. Uh, he sent us to a hot, red earth environment in Arizona, presumably in some area around modern Sedona, in around 100 million BC. And we saw uh, the <clears throat> dinosaurs that existed at that time in prehistory. Wow. So that was the reach they had with Pronovision because there was no temporal limit because all they had to do to get us home to the present was just collapse the hologram. Oh, it was really? danger we'd be stuck in a in 100 million BC, you know. So, so now, uh, w with that in mind, were you actually physically at that location, or was it just a, a, a some kind of depiction, some kind of perception, some kind of a illusion of where yeah, you were? Andrew, at? that's a really great question. So, it, it really goes to what was happening, what in terms of developmentally, when I was on the project. When we were first being sent in uh, to the past, in, in these holograms, these time space holograms propagated by these devices that they were calling chronovisors, by the way, rather than looking class devices, as Harry Cassidy and some other journalists have tried to establish that terminology. They were always and only called chronovisors when I was serving on Project Pegasus. And in fact, that search term has been found in some of the records by, by people that I've encountered with ties to the U.S. intelligence community actually connected me to Pegasus through documents that contain the word chronovisor. Huh. Um, but um, actually, can you repeat your question again? I no, well, uh, uh, well, so you're go now you're traveling through these these uh, holograms, holograph graphics, and so the the, the location that you're being uh, teleported or sent to are are they illusions or are they real? Oh, right, 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 right. Okay, yeah. When we first started being sent to the past, we said that we were quote unquote the Jack Pruitt said this, that we were a spectral presence in the past times and places we're sending you to. And he said, like a ghost in our quantum environment. Got it. 
In other words, he was saying we, we were just like a super luminal super imposition over that quantum environment, that time space coordinate. Okay. But, and that was called three dimensional quantum vision. But then when I was serving and being chronovised from quantum vision trips began in the, in, uh, in the, uh, fall of 1970, and they lasted through spring of 72. And uh, they then announced to us that they were introducing fourth dimensional chronovision. And the, the implication of that was that if we were in the past event, because most of this was time travel to the past, most of what I was involved in was time travel to the past, that if we were in for more than 15 minutes, we would be stuck there. We, we, we would become embedded <laughs> in the past. Wow. And they had to, when that happened, they had to send this portal that was indicated by a device that looked like a soccer goal, like the, like the structure of a soccer goal without yeah. the net. Huh. It was just like an aperture that they used to identify to us visually where the portal was. And when we saw that, we had to run towards it and run through it. And then we would sort of be... We'd be sucked into the portal and we would be running and we would find ourselves running in deeper and deeper sand. And they had connected that portal to the back of a dinosaur tunnel, kind of like amusement at a defunct um, New Jersey amusement park. I think it was <laughs> some, some New Jerseyans listening, they remember that there was a, a famous, uh, or kind of actually local, but still nonetheless pretty, pretty, uh, pretty illustrious, uh, amusement park in New Jersey known as Bertram's Island. So there was a dinosaur tunnel there. I believe that's what, where they were bringing us back to, where they had set up the, the 1971 side of that tunnel, that portal, at the back of the, the dinosaur tunnel. So we would, we would run towards the soccer goal-like device and then be sucked in and find ourselves running in deeper and deeper sand. And then we would realize we were in the dinosaur tunnel. We always kind of superstitiously tap this metal dinosaur up near the front of the tunnel <laughs> right. and wait for it wait for this guy to show up to take us in a minivan, like a small school bus or van huh. back to Morristown where the, where the, uh, the chronovisor lab was that we were being inserted uh, into the past. In fact, that tunnel was being used when we teleported. If they had to circumvent the teleportation process just for safety reasons, we would be decanted to that same tunnel and then be taken from there back to Curtis Wright in, in Woodridge where, where the teleportation device was. Got so, it. And answer your question, I was involved in both. When we were initially first being chronomized, we were just a spectral presence in this past event. We were like a ghost in our environment. So you were just observ that, observers or experiencers in, in another location and, and all you were yeah, doing like was observing. Yeah, to us before we were sent to, to, to prehistoric Arizona to see the dinosaurs that if one of the dinosaurs, you know, these huge creatures stepped on us we wouldn't be crushed. We would just see like a shadow. We would see the foot coming down <laughs> and we would be inside the leg of the dinosaur holographically and then the dinosaur would walk past us and we would be uninjured. But then in 1971, they announced to us that no, if you're in for more than 15 minutes, a density effect is going to occur and we're going to have to extract you from the quantum hologram. Now, when that was occurring, they kept on telling me at the lab because they put... Well, they, there was a there was a chronovisor array at Marstown and what is now the Marstown, New Jersey Performing Arts Center, the Mars County Performing Arts Center. They also ended up putting another chronovisor array back at Curtis Wright where the teleport was. And every time I would arrive back from like three days of being inserted into the past, I would say, you know, look, I'm starving. You, you, you know, <laughs> I had me there for days, but they would say, no, we didn't. You were only in for 15 minutes. So I'm not even sure that the technical reality of what was happening was even understood by the people who were the technicians of the project because that was that was a standing dispute between myself and the technicians. I would say, well, what? why didn't you take it? Why didn't you take a lunch with you? I don't understand. Why didn't you take dinner with you? That doesn't make any sense. Duh. I was a little kid. I had taken lunch with, with me to school. <laughs> sometimes we were spending all day in, in New Mexico, and then we were teleporting back when we had spent the whole day in New Mexico, and it was dinner. And if we if we weren't taking Howard Johnson, I, it was now like, you know, I had spent all the way till dusk or even into the night in Albuquerque. And then we were when we were jumping back to Curtis Wright in Woodridge, New Jersey, it was like 11 o'clock. So by the time I got home from school at 3 o'clock, it was like it was 11 o'clock and elapsed time, and I, I hadn't eaten lunch. Okay, wow. But in, in some of the cases, 
I was fed. Before you in went? The places I was being sent to. No, no, in the places where I was being sent to by Cronovich. And let me say, like when I was served this porridge in, in Holland around 1800, the soup did not go through me because at that point, where I had enough hunger to agree to be fed by nice people that I met when I was going back to the past, the density effect had occurred, and I was really metabolizing my food. I was being fed by nice people I met while time traveling. So you were actually I was just, you were actually feeling like you were filled up. Is that what you're saying? Well, my point is that when the density effect was occurring, and we were stuck in those past locations and had to look for the soccer goal-like contraption to find the portal to run through it to get back to the present through that basically that teleporter that was connected to the dinosaur tunnel in the amusement park. In those jumps where I would have enough hunger to eat, to want to eat, if I was somebody tried to feed me, when I drank soup, for example, it didn't like splash on the ground. We weren't holograms. We were really there physically. Oh, got and it. We were metabolizing our food because our stomachs were there with us. Our stomachs were capturing uh, the porridge we were being fed or whatever, you know. There was one time, for example, I was sent to the Five Points neighborhood, basically the lower east side of, of uh of, of New York City of Manhattan uh, in around 1905, and it was an extremely miserable location. The entire interior of the tenement that I was staying with these these orphans who this nice Irish immigrant lady was looking after, and a few young men who were like one was about 25, that it was 40, and they were coming home from their factory jobs absolutely exhausted. She was feeding us like onion and turnip soup oh my God. twice a day. <laughs> and I was there for three days. Oh, wow. And it was just enough to sort of fill up my stomach and kill my hunger for a couple hours. But that soup did not go through me. I metabolized it. When I did get back to Curtis Wright, I was saying, can you get me a sandwich or something? I was in for three days. And they were saying, no, you weren't, Andy. We, we watched every minute of it. You were in for 15 <laughs> minutes. So if they were right, maybe what was happening is I was kind of strode between quickly between one scene or another. And it only was 15 minutes, and maybe just the stress was making me hungry. But I remember times of absolute hunger, um, while while you know while being chronovised and spending long long periods of time in different locations. In some cases. So now let me let me get this straight. Point. So you 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 say within when you were te teleported uh, to a location within the first 15 minutes you were still a hologram. You like uh, like a ghost like figure there yeah. and if you were if to eat something was, yeah. if you were to eat something it would just go through you and it would just drop on the floor is that what i hear you saying in, in fact i think i was served some soup when i was still three-dimensional chronovising and it did pour through me it splashed all over the floor because i was basically a ghost in their time wow and so after 15 presence as jack pruitt said after, after when, they, yeah. when they evolved fourth dimensional chronovision we were physically there, and our stomachs were capturing our food when we were being served food or drink. Okay, so so after a human at, ritual is to serve a newcomer water or a beverage, you know, fruit juice, some apple juice, or some soup, and just sit somebody down at your table and feed them. That's a basic human ritual. So there were times when the locals in the time space place I was being sent. I call them time places, a derivation of time space, but. A location in time space I call a time place. So in some of these time places, it was just normal courtesy, normal social ritual to sit a newcomer down at your kitchen table and feed them, even if you were poor. <laughs> right. There were times when I was fed, you know, I was fed a sandwich or a bowl of soup or some porridge, you know, some kind of like chicken stock, maybe with a couple galleons floating in it, a real <coughs> basic food, a piece of bread. And it wasn't until we started fourth dimensional chronovising that that soup, if I was first served soup or a beverage or something, that water, apple juice or whatever, didn't spill on the floor. Because when I was initially going, I was just a spectral presence. I, I was basically a hologram superimposed over their real time and place. Got it, got it. Okay, and so let, let, me, uh, let me finish this up real quick. Uh, so after 15 minutes, you actually became a real time part of the environment. And then later on, uh, and, and you were actually, you, you were, you, you had to go to the, the, the field goal thing in order to get back. So now, and then they incre uh, created the fourth dimensional chronovisor where when you get there, you're already real time there when you're there, arrived. Well, actually, 
actually when they introduced well actually it's, it's more truncated than that when they introduced fourth dimensional chronovision we would be a spectral presence for about 15 minutes but then after if we were in as we put it like we use the phrase in country or just in yeah when we were in for more than 15 minutes a density effect would occur where we were there was basically a collapse so that we were physically there and we had to be extracted got it so and, with, and, and that, that was where they introduced the portals that, that were like the soccer goal devices that we would look for in our local environment. In right. fact, they had taken us up to the Picatinny Arsenal. Um, uh, I think that's in Parsippany, New Jersey. I'm not sure, but that's an army base. And they had, had, a, had sort of trained us in almost like a Pavlovian way to run toward the soccer goals that army corpsmen were shoving into location. They'd say, look, a portal. And we were being trained to just run, run run like hell towards that portal when we, you know, we found out there was a portal behind us because there was so much time during which we could get to that portal and go through that, you know, that device that we called a portal and get through the Tesla portal that they were opening up outside the hologram to get us back to the present. So it was kind of like an emergency maneuver we had to do. So after the 15 minutes, how much time did you have to get back to the, to the, to the um, uh, soccer, uh, the field goal? Well, Dubai. we knew at that point that we could be in a very long time because we the density effect had occurred, and we were now physically in that time and place, and we were going to have to have the portal show up to get home to the present. So what, what I'm saying is sometimes from my perspective in time, it then took three days. I, I think <laughs> that tenement, for example, in, in the Five Points neighborhood of New York City, because that's what one of the kids said out in the street, this bully said, this is five points. That's where you are. Wow. You know, uh, and it really wasn't until um, Steven Spielberg's uh, film, The Gangs of New York, that I realized that that's where I had been sent in New York City. One of the kids was very sympathetic, and I, I had told him I was from New Jersey, but New Jersey in 1971. I said, what year is it here? And he says, 1905. What do you think? Oh, my God. Jeez. So, you know, this kid could have been, this kid protecting <laughs> me. Could have been some little, you know, wow. Louis Neither or some famous New Yorker from the, tur- from okay. the turn of the last century, you know. So, um, 1900. was certainly a nice kid who was looking out for me. You know, so you hang know, on, hang on a second. The, and, pushing the bully away. Andrew, yeah. um, uh, I got a caller here on the, on the line. Air code 914. Aloha, you're on the air. Hello, uh, uh, area code 914, did you want to ask a question? Okay, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure that they wanted to ask a question, that's okay. So, um, so what we're going to do, um, we're going to take a breather right now. Uh, we're going to play some music, Wisdom of Nature by Serena Gabriel from her album Diving Deep. We're going to send out love, blessings, healings, angels of light and love to, of course, you, Andrew, and all your family and friends, and to your vehicle and place of Thank residence, you. to me and my family and friends, and to my place of residence and my... Uh, whatever vehicle I'm going to get in anytime soon. And um, also to all the kids and all the animals and the plants on the planet, especially the ones in need and concern. Uh, the, uh, to the President of the United States, boy, that guy needs to know. And all his entourage. And um, I want to send out love, blessings, healings, angels of light and love to all the people having to deal with those fires in California. Wow, that's huge. That's like epic. And so um, to all those people, anyone you want to add to that, uh, Andrew? No, I just second your concern uh, for the people of Southern California. I lived in Chatsworth, California, off and on between 1972 and 2003, and I have relatives there, and I I would just share with your listeners uh, the fact that I found out from one of my immediate family members who lives there uh, close to where the fires are that those fires were incinerating a a football field area of ground Every minute. Yeah, yeah, oh, wow. So the fires, wow. In, the fires in Southern California are unprecedented they in are. terms of their ferocity in, in recorded history. And so uh, our thoughts and prayers really go out to those who have lost their homes and those who are living uh, with the uh, quite understandable fear that they, they may lose their property. Here. Yeah, exactly. It's just been a, a hellish fire season yeah. in and Southern California. I also want to add, send out love, blessings, healings, angels, light and love. Uh, to this person, uh, Eric code 914, and all your family and friends. To everyone else in need and concern, we will be back. Wisdom of, the, of Nature by Serena Gabriel from her album Diving Deep. Thank you. 
This is Andrew Loho Live out of Flagstaff, Arizona, for Spiritual Image Productions on Block Talk Radio and Pre Conference Call on YouTube, establishing and maintaining relationships with human values. Aloha and welcome to tonight's show. Uh, welcome back to tonight's show. Uh, Andrew Loho Live uh, talking with Andrew D. Chicago out of uh, Washington, talking about teleportation, life on Mars, and confessed time travel. We've talked about how uh, Andrew. Lee Bushago grew up in, in California, Southern California. Is that correct, Andrew? Well, I was time traveling when we were still living in New Jersey. But then in college, when I was brought into the CIA's Mars Jump Room program, we were in California, and I was, I was attending UCLA as an undergraduate. For those years. Got it. So you, you grew up in New Jersey, and um, your dad, your dad uh, embarked upon uh, the Pegasus Project, uh, an affiliation or underneath the umbrella of Dar- 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 DARPA, is that correct? Correct. He was the, he was the uh, country's leading expert on Tesla teleportation, so, so he was essentially the chief technical liaison between the Ralph M. Parsons Company and the Central Intelligence Agency on the theory and practice of Tesla teleportation, and so that's why he uh, was attached to the project. He had been working on defense projects since he was brought into the Ramjet project at Curtis Wright several months after the July 1952 overflight of our nation's capital by nine extraterrestrial craft clocked by radar at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia as traveling at 7,000 miles per hour. So he, he'd been working in the classified defense realm for virtually his entire career. Um, beginning in the second year of his career after taking a BS in electrical engineering from Lehigh University in Pennsylvania in the class of 1951. Uh, he was then brought into classified defense work about a year later in October of 1952. He worked on the Ramjet. He worked on the instrumentation for the B-70, which was going to be the atomic power source equipped strategic bomber. And then he began to work on Tesla teleportation in the late 50s and early 60s at, at uh, the Thomas Edison Research Lab in, in West Orange, New Jersey. Got it, got it. And so um, now let me ask you this. Have, have you gone back, any of you gone back and talked to Tesla about any of this yet? Has anybody gone back and talked to Tesla? Was that, was that your question? That's correct. That's a, that's a great question, Andrew. Um, in fact, it's anecdotal. I don't have direct evidence of it, but I had conversations with the writer Alexander Bruce um, about a meeting that she had with Jack Pruitt, who I knew and had contact with extensively on the project because of all the team leaders. He was involved in training myself and the other children in my immediate group on teleporting to New Mexico from Curtis Wright in Woodward, New Jersey, and also visiting different locations in the past from the chronovisor arrays in Morristown, New Jersey, at ITT Defense Communications in Nutley, New Jersey, and other locations. So I had extensive contact with Jack Pruitt, who Nichols and Moon identified in their series of books about Project Montauk as the research director of Montauk. And right. Chica Bruce informed me that when she did dinner with Jack Pruitt and his late son, Glenn Pruitt, who I think was about a year older than me, he was one of my child contemporaries on the project, um, that Jack Pruitt showed Chica Bruce a photograph of himself 
and his his late father with Tesla. Oh, wow. Jack was born in 1934, and Tesla died in 1943. So there were only eight or nine years between Jack's birth and Tesla's death. So in a real-time conception, Jack could not have been present in the photograph as like a 34-year-old, but he was. Wow. 1934 plus 34 is 68, and that's right around when Iris was first brought into the project from that teleporting with my dad from Curtis Wright to meet with Dr. Agnew at the Los Alamos Labs. So she insists that Jack showed her uh, what in every way looked like a a, a real photograph of of Jack with his father, not his son Glenn, but his, his father, meeting with Tesla when Tesla was still alive, presumably in the 1930s or early 1940s. So, yes, one of the principals of Project Pegasus and his father went back and met with Tesla. So that may have actually resulted in some link-ups in evidentiary terms, you know, technically and scientifically speaking, that there was there was enough time travel achieved for the people on Project, or at least some of the individuals on Project Pegasus to go back and uh, and literally meet and, and be briefed by Tesla when Tesla was still alive. For example, when I ran into my father at the Lincoln uh, speech site in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, in 1863, having been sent there from spring of 1972 by Dr. Sterling Colgate of New the New Mexico Institute of Science and Technology and my late father from a time lab in East Hanover, New Jersey. My father was much younger than he was in real time when they sent me in like 1972. For example, he had the weight that he had after he quit smoking in 1964. He still had that weight gain, and he had a crew cut. So I believe that my dad's involvement in time travel began in the mid-1960s when I was just three or four years old. And he said, you know, it's when I ran into you in Gettysburg that I realized you were going to be <laughs> in the right? project because you were, <laughs> you know, but you were like four or five older, you, you were four or five years older than you were back at the house. Wow. And I said, well, well, you were four or five years younger in Gettysburg than you were back at the time lab in East Hanover when you and Dr. Colgate, who we used to call Stir, that was his nickname for Sterling. So Stir Colgate, who was the heir to the the Colgate Palmolive of Fortune. Oh, wow. Which, of course, was was right there in East Canada, what is today called Menem Corporation, or Menem. Um, my dad was, you know, when I, I met him in Gettysburg, he was like five years younger than he had been right there in the very time lab that they sent me <coughs> from to Gettysburg to see to see the Gettysburg Address. So I think that really marks the, the, the advent of Project Pegasus would be around Maybe 1966 or so. When uh, actually, when I I, I think I think it's young. It's, 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 it's older than that, uh, Andrew. And yet, I don't think you didn't even realize that it's when you actually met your father back in back in that that what, what was it, uh, 1963 or something like that. When was it that you met him? No, I, I met him. I left 1972 for 1863. 1863. And he said <laughs> you were you were older. You were older than you were back at the house. And he looked. He looked about the, the weight and the condition with his crew cut and everything that he was when I was about four or five. So since he joined Parsons Jordan, a subsidiary of the Ralph M. Parsons Company, in 1966, I think that Parsons Jordan was the first cover that was being used to, to conceal Project Pegasus. They had one contract, which was a copper a contract with, with uh, Anaconda, the Chilean copper conglomerate. <laughs> And I think that probably their copper mines around the United States were probably being used to conceal some of the time travel technologies and so forth. And, 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 uh, I, and because he said you were go ahead. I clear. I, well, I clearly had to be alive from his time space coordinate, and he was at an age where I recognized his appearance, but it was from about four years earlier, and I was ten and a half when they sent me to Gettysburg. So I I think that he was actually sent from around. 1966 to Gettysburg in 1863, and then I would say, you know, six years later, five or six years later, because that's how. Well, younger. and and that's what I'm saying is that I believe that that's when the project actually started was back in 1863. The inceptions of it began, and then eventually the the real 
the uh, it started to physical uh, uh, man- manifest in the physical further down the road uh, in the 40s and 50s. Well, you know, President Kennedy 60s. in his famous state <clears throat> speech at Rice University in Texas on September 12th of 1962, you may recall he said, "We choose to go to the moon and do the other thing." <clears throat> Nobody has ever asked. What did President Kennedy mean by the other exactly, thing? Exactly, exactly. You know, so it, so in fact, Pegasus could have had its initial <clears throat> origins in, in during the Kennedy years. I, I I quite agree, but they certainly didn't have their origin um, in in the 1860s because you know Tesla wouldn't be born until what 18 1869 or 1859. Oh, I I, I so don't I don't know. About, Go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so we're talking about. You know, the crystallization of the project around Parsons would have been around the time that the Parsons Jordan subsidiary was created in 1966. Got it. Got it. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I was alive at that point, but I was only four or five years old. And that my dad indicated that, that that's what I was back at the house at the time that he encountered me in Gettysburg, having been sent there for four or five years later. I was like an older version of myself when, got it, got when it. he encountered me in front of the dais to which Lincoln would soon be arriving to give his Gettysburg address. So now, um, one of the things that, that I, I, do you have a book out on all these stories yet, or what, what's going on with that? No, you know, I'm so busy practicing law and giving interviews and then running for president. I basically have the story blocked <laughs> out, but I really just have to bear down and knock out the book. I, will, I think that would be, be the be. best idea, because uh, that way... Yeah, that way. Yeah, I'm going to go actually... I'm going to go into the three-year period here of book writing, <laughs> so that that will be delivered relatively soon. Now, j- just to let by. you know, um, there's a website called createspace.com. You can go claim your title there officially, and uh, that way nobody will steal your title, and then you can turn around and upload the, the, the book after, when you're ready. So it's like that, and then you can... Right. I'm going to go, uh, yeah, I'm going to go Amazon Create Space. Yeah, yeah I, I would definitely I would suggest that. So now let, let's take a step forward now. And, and I'm sure we can probably do another interview and talk more about all this stuff and, and, and go, go on for days. I don't know. But, but anyhow, and, we, and, and if you want, we, we can. We can bring you back in for another interview and go from there. But sure, let, let's, sure. let's go. Let's take a step forward and let's talk about Mars. What, so, what, so you're doing all these teleportations. And, and then what ha- when do you go? You now, you said you, go to, you went to Mars. Is that correct? Right. So I was time traveling as a kid from age 6 to 11, and then in November of 72, we moved to Southern California because you may recall that Parsons, which is the world's leading process engineering company, moved from its offices on Wall Street in New York City, initially to Los Angeles in 1972, and I, all of my time travel stuff had completed, and then they built that six-acre campus out in Pasadena, and that's where they still are. And so I then had an ordinary junior high and high school period. I went off to college at UC San Diego for a year. And in my freshman year at UC San Diego, my dad said, you have to put it, put through an intercampus transfer to LA because we're going to be doing stuff up here and you need to be in the Los Angeles area. So I transferred to UCLA as a, as a college sophomore. But in that summer before my second year of college, my father and I attended a Mars training program that was held at College of the Siskiyous in Northern California, right near. Oh Mount no Canada. way! And that's where the um, WESAC Festival used to be, and I used to be the official photographer for it for five years in a row with under uh, Joshua David Stone. Do you remember that? You know that, about that? Well, I know there's been a lot of interesting cultural things there. But anyhow, yeah. that was a program that I took with with Barack Obama. We're kind of no Indian. kidding. I'll be William darned. Stilling, <clears throat> uh, Willie Willie McCool, and five young people in our relative age group that have not been identified. So wow. five of the ten uh, teenagers have been identified, and then Bernard Mendez was somewhat older than the rest of us, and he was there sort of as a participant observer who's being dropped into Project Pegasus to, excuse me, to the Mars Jump Room program to solve some of the mysteries of what was going on in the project. Like people were being devoured by these dinosaur-like predators and then showing up at the, at the Jump Room facilities on Mars asking to go home. So something, some kind of bizarre set of strange causality was going on that was reversing things that were happening as if the as if we were accessing Mars holographically. Now, what's interesting about the Jump Root program is in the same way that 
Project Pegasus sort of rested on the leadership of one very prominent American industrialist and defense contractor named Ralph M. Parson, not to be confused with Jack Parsons of the L. Ron Hubbard, a Lester Crowley group called the Babylon Working. This was another man named Parsons. In a similar way, the Mars Jump Route program <coughs> rested on the cutting edge work of a very, a much more even famous industrial, so that was Howard Hughes. The, really the un, the untold story of the Mars Jump Route program is it was a latter day work of Howard Hughes in the late 70s and early 80s when in fact he was still alive. And what I'm saying here, Andrew, is that Howard Hughes' alleged death in April of 1976 was fake to, to protect him from abduction or assassination while he was working on sensitive defense projects connected to the CIA. They included the Glomar Explorer, which was a submersible that was designed and built to pick up a Soviet submarine um, that had that sunk and was resting on the floor of the Atlantic, or excuse me, the Pacific Ocean, and the Mars Jump Route Program. So I, I literally met and interacted with Howard Hughes at a time when conventional history says he was already deceased, but he was not deceased. And in fact, I've spoken and now appeared on several radio programs with Major General Mark Music and Douglas Weldon, the TV producer. Uh, about the fact that Hughes' death was fake. In fact, he, he died at age 93 in the year 2001, not in 1976. Oh, and wow. With the long hair and fingernails, and it was just a demented, emaciated mess. That was not the real Howard Hughes. In fact, there was an interview for television with Howard Hughes in 1975, and he was still his, his dashing self. He was not the emaciated, um, demented weirdo that, they, that the cover story made him out to be by 1976. So we now have another Mars jumper, William White Crow, who has spoken with music and Wellman about the hidden history of Howard Hughes and his linkage to the jump room program. So really, my career in defense work and the cosmic privilege I was given to time travel and also to go to Mars utilizing one of these time travel technologies really rested on two cover-ups. The fact that the Manhattan Project physicists who built the atomic bomb were also working on time travel technology wow. during and after World War II, and that Howard Hughes' death in 1976 was fake, and he continued to take his career developing advanced aircraft into the realm of time travel technology. And that's, I, I'm really, I really feel fortunate that I got a chance to meet Mr. Hughes and and work on one of his latter, latter projects because he was, you know, a great American genius. And I think a major reason why the Jump Room program was capable of being undertaken was that Hughes was leading it. He had an office there at the Jump Room facility in El Segundo, California. Wow. You know, so, so I, and I, I actually would, wouldn't mind meeting that guy, too. He must have been a, a huge legend to, to to me, I'm, I'm sure of it. You know, I didn't realize at the time it was Hughes because I was such a, I was such a, a reader of news magazines in my teens and twenties. You know, I was reading whatever we were subscribing to at the house at a particular time. It was Time, Newsweek, U.S. News and World Report. I was always devouring news. I wanted to become a journalist when I was in high school and college, and so I was just literally reading usually Time magazine cover to cover from around age I don't know. 13 to 24 or so, which encompassed that period in the early 80s when I was jumping to Mars. And so when I met Mr. Hughes, I didn't realize I was being introduced to him. What had happened is my fellow jumper, uh, Bernard Mendez, had collapsed about three quarters of a mile from one of the jumpers, and I couldn't resuscitate him, but I could see that he had a heartbeat and was breathing. So I did a fireman's carry on my right shoulder, and I I brought Bernie, or Benny, as we sometimes call Bernard Mendez, into the jump room to the point where I was literally pancaking it on the ground. I was, I've described it, you know, carrying him that far in, a, in an oxygen-deficient environment was like trying to, you know, walk through some of that plastic that they put around trees, you know, in the yards to protect the tree. 
It was like trying to walk through resilient plastic. It was almost impossible. I had to put them down to the ground three times. Wow. Because I did not have it. Imagine being 180 pounds into the prime of life, you know, 20 years old, but being at, let's say, 14,000 feet on Earth and having to carry somebody you know, at 180 pounds, having to carry somebody 160 pounds on your right shoulder for, for a mile or half a mile. I'm not really sure how far it was, but it was not a short distance. I may have had a heart attack during that episode because they have found an artifact in my account, like focal point, that indicates the art of them, like a past heart attack, like an ancient heart attack, as oh. they say theology. So I think it was during that episode because I didn't have oxygen normally just to walk straight around on Mars without getting really severe cramps in my legs. In this instance, I had to endure those pains, but also carrying Bernie into the jump room facility with just a point collapse, you know. So I think that I actually had a kind of Richard knew that end up to find Hughes in 1906 because Nixon had learned at the CIA that Hughes was still alive. And Bernie was the clear intelligence officer that Nixon had to find Hughes for him. So Hughes ended up being befriending and being befriended by Betty Mendez. So when he heard the fate of his life by Mendez into the uh, jump room facility called the court, it was sort of like a a conch shield, like a spiral. He, he had to bring me over there to his office. It was probably Bernard Mendez. I don't remember who it was. It could have been White Crow, you know. And when I came over, he was very friendly, and he had almost like a prissy smile. Howard Hughes had that that small mouth and kind of a sweet smile when he was pleased about something. He said, oh, is, it, is this Andy? You're Andy? Please, Andy. Howard Hughes. <laughs> and he shook my hand up. I didn't realize it was Nick Hughes <laughs> right. because he was shorter than he was supposed to because he had a big scar. I learned from that he had a big scar. In addition to that aircraft that he had had in, in Beverly Hills earlier. And so he didn't look his original 6'4". He looked about 6'4". And I was my original 5'10 at that time, so he really wasn't that much taller than me. But he had looked about 4'4". Four, four and, uh, and, and there were other times when I thinking it was the just something that he did. And he was an utterly, utterly mean person. Like when he was there. <laughs> in other words, like for that, you know, he would go man, and he was just utterly miserable. Wow. So he was a genius, very bipolar. But when he was nice, he was turning to me to turn on a dime and start looking at somebody where I, you know, I, I, I didn't read it. My dad never pulled that kind of treatment of, to one of the secretaries or somebody at Parsons. I would have taken him aside and said, Dad, you can't do that, and I don't want to be in the <laughs> with you. My dad, my dad treated people much more nicely than that. Yeah. So Hughes was a kind of a study in opposites. But I feel very lucky that I've now been able to link up William Whitecrow's testimony my own m- memories of meeting, quote-unquote, Mr. Hughes, not really realizing it was the Howard Hughes. And now the yeoman work that's been done by uh, Wellman and Music, establishing that, in fact, Howard Hughes lived far beyond 1976, and that we know from my experience and uh, and White Crow, but also collateral testimony from Bernard Mendez, that indeed Howard Hughes was a principal consultant of the Jump Room program. Wow, wow. Now that's interesting. So um, I tell you what, we, we got we got about what six minutes, five minutes left. Um, what or, or, if, if you want, we can bring you back and talk about life on Mars. And then in the meantime, I'd love to do that. I, I'm trying to I'm trying to bring that forward because really, because I I, I I already know that that's going to be a whole show in itself. So why don't we do that and and we'll we'll talk about life on Mars and um and and, and next next interview and then and then me, meantime. Do you have anything um, else left? I mean, do you have anything going on right now that you want to talk about and let people let know, let people know about anything? Anything? Well, coming up? you know, I'm going to be working on 
a short book about the transitions we're going through. You know, we're going through different historical transitions, like from religion to spirituality, um, from banking to, di to, to digital currency and so forth. And I want to kind of categorize all of them. But I want to say that for those who don't believe me, remember, <clears throat> first of all, remember that my account starts 50 years ago. I'm 56 years old this year. Wow. And in fact, I'm 57 biologically because because of my time looping while time traveling. <laughs> right. We estimate that I did about an extra year of experience. My dad did eight extra years of what we call quantum displacement, where you teleport somewhere, spend time there, and then teleport not back to where you came from, not just in space, but in time. Okay. Andrew, so, I hate to say this, I wanna, but I wanna, but if you if we were to collect. Uh, uh, add up all the years you've been all, all, all everywhere else. You're probably about 105 years old, I bet you. But that's besides the point. <laughs> no, no, I'm actually, <laughs> not, I'm actually about 50 years old. But I just want to emphasize that my story begins 50 years ago. We were already <laughs> dealing with 200 year old or 200 year in the future technology at that point. And your listeners have to remember that these were the central secret defense projects that trillions of dollars were being spent on. I mean, in 1972, Ralph Parsons, for example, bought the world's most expensive yacht from Adnan Khashoggi, the Iraqi uh, billionaire, and renamed it Pegasus II, even though he had never owned anything. Oh, interesting. Pegasus that we could identify. Huh. So these are the calling cards. My point is, we have to get over the cognitive dissonance that we were taught by the, the modern education and religious and public and institutions of our society because they were constructed to enforce secrecy and, and a misunderstanding of the nature of reality. Even the, the genre of science fiction was crafted, it was invented for disinformational purposes. I mean, two prominent science fiction writers, Arthur C. Clarke and Robert Heinlein, two of the greats of the in the pantheon of science fiction writers, had desks next to each other at British intelligence during the war. Okay, the teleportation you see on Star Trek was disinformation. And I even had a cast member of Star Trek, I forget her name, but she was Chekhov's girlfriend in the, in the TV show, you know, in Star Trek, trying to tell me that, that Gene Roddenberry wasn't crafting disinformation for the government. He was just trying to tell a science fiction story. But my point here is that if you disbelieve me, step back and appreciate the fact that my story actually begins a half century ago. And since then, Ben Rich, the CEO of Lockheed, stated that anything you think we can develop, we already have. We now have the technology to take ET home. Wow. And you don't just invent nothing when you take the Manhattan Project physicists, brilliant electrical engineers like my father working from capitalist paperwork, and spend trillions of dollars hiring the best the best industrialists like Ralph Parsons and Howard Hughes, and the best engineering and defense contractors 90 like, Hughes, seconds. like Parsons, like Lockheed Skunkworks, and not do things like develop time travel technology. That's what these people achieved, and they achieved it when we were little kids. So wow. we need to really step back and take a proper reckoning of where uh, advanced applications in quantum physics really So don't, don't persecute me. <laughs> Get with the program. Stop being down on what you're not up on. Because all of us are, are down on what we're not up on. We were, we were deceived by our government. So, Andrew, real quick, uh, do you have any events coming up, anything that you're going to be participating in, presenting at anytime soon? Yeah. I'm going to be speaking in Ashland, Oregon uh, on January 5th and 6th and at Kelowna, British Columbia, Canada, on February 24th. That's what's scheduled for early 2018. And is that information on your website? Uh, it will be on my Project Pegasus' personal pages on Facebook, which okay. I use now for okay, most so of my on, on your uh, discourse about time travel and, and march with, with the public. Got it. So I want to thank you for your time. Uh, we're all out of time here now, Andrew. And again, we'll see about bringing you back up for another interview about Life on Mars. I want to thank all of you for stopping by. Have a God guide us a week. Be the love that you are. Always have been and always will be. Aloha.
Thank you for using Blog Talk 